At 6.02 p.m. on May 18, 2001, a 59-year-old company employee by the name of Kinefuchi Kiyoshi clocked out of work. Unbeknownst to him, earlier that day somebody had called his wife's work to inform them that she would be taking a few days off for a family emergency. Neither were ever seen again. The case of the missing Chiba couple is a mystery riddled with enigmas. Let's step back a few days earlier, to May 15th, a Tuesday. It's here that the real mystery first picks up. Kinefuchi Ikuko, 54 years old, called her boss Yamada at the job she worked part-time. She requested the day off because the police would be coming to visit her that day. Upon later questioning, Yamada revealed what Ikuko had told him over the phone. According to her, the police had informed her that a gang of thieves were working in the neighbourhood. Two had been caught, but one was still on the loose. This man was extremely skilled with computers and possessed a high intellect. The police further informed her that this highly intelligent thief would undoubtedly strike her house soon and that he was no doubt watching as they spoke. This thief knew not only the layout of her house, but all about her family, their schedules, and other information that only they should know. At first, Ikuko was suspicious of this man calling himself a police officer, so she called her husband. The officer greeted Kiyoshi cheerfully when he arrived home from work at 7.30pm and informed him of the same information he had shared with his wife before leaving. The officer was, of course, not a real police officer. Yet despite Ikuko's initial suspicions, the man seemed to have convinced Kiyoshi, and the couple's doubts were washed away. At 9am the following morning, a man who gave the name Hironaka appeared at the couple's house. Claiming to be a forensic investigator, he once again informed Ikuko that the thief on the run was extremely skilled with computers, and that he would be able to withdraw money from their accounts without them realising it. The man handed her a damage report sheet and asked Ikuko to fill in the details of their bank accounts so the police could keep a close eye on them for any suspicious activity. She did as requested and confirmed the information with her personal stamp. At 8am on May 17th, Ikuko once again called work and informed them, the police are coming again today so I'll be late to work. If they come after 12, then I'd like the day off. She ended up not going into work. At 10.01am and 5.41pm, Kiyoshi made two separate calls to the real estate, requesting that their locks be changed. The following morning, Friday, the last day both of them would be seen, Kiyoshi left the house at 7am and clocked into work at 816 Early that same morning, a man claiming to be Kiyoshi then called Ikuko's work. He said there had been an accident in the family, and Ikuko would be taking two or three days off. The person who answered, confused, offered to switch the call over to a supervisor, but the man refused and then hung up. Upon hearing this, Yamada grew worried and decided to visit the couple's house. He arrived at 10am. Their car was in the garage, but nobody answered the door when he rang. Yamada then went to the rear of the house to look inside, and found a man standing on the left-hand side. He described the man as 160 to 170 centimetres tall, in his early 60s, with short hair and an angular chin. Neighbours later saw the same man loitering around the Kinefuchi's house and reported him to the police. Yet, when Yamada saw him, the man instantly turned away from him and said, Don't say anything. Although finding the man suspicious, Yamada assumed the man really was a police officer who was quietly watching the Kinefuchi's house and left him alone. At 1.45pm that same day, a man wearing a baseball cap and mask visited the bank in front of Chiba Station, claiming to be Kinefuchi Kiyoshi. He asked to close his term deposit account 
and withdrew the 3,500,000 yen still in it. The man was captured on the bank's security cameras, and a single still was later released to the public. The man appeared to be in his 50s or 60s, 165 centimetres tall, square-jawed with broad shoulders and damaged ears like those who have taken part in martial arts for many years. The logo on his cap appeared to be a mixture of the letters C and D, most likely the logo of the Chunichi Dragons baseball team from Nagoya. It's possible that this man was the same person Yamada saw when he visited the Kinofuchi's house, but it may have also been an accomplice. At 6.02pm, the real Kiyoshi left work, apparently unaware that someone posing as him during the day had called his wife's work to inform them she wouldn't be coming in, and then closed his bank account, withdrawing all his money. After leaving work, Kiyoshi disappeared. It wasn't until May 22nd, four days later, that Kiyoshi's boss grew worried when he hadn't come into work for the last two days. Like Ikuko's boss, Kiyoshi's boss went to their house and found the front door locked, the storm shutters closed, and the garage door open, with the car gone. Various letters and leaflets poked out of the patch letterbox. He called the police right away, followed by the Kinefuchi's eldest son. Their son arrived at 10pm that same day, after leaving Tochigi Prefecture, where he lived at the time. Together with the police, their eldest son entered the Kinefuchi's house. Their son found it highly suspicious that neither of them were home, yet there were no signs that the house had been broken into. He grew even more suspicious when he found his father's suit jacket sitting on top of a chair. His parents were extremely neat and tidy, and would never leave clothes lying around. Moreover, there was no sign of his suit pants or business shirt. Their worst suspicions seemed to be confirmed when they found blood stains in the bathroom that appeared to have been wiped clean. The police carried out a thorough investigation of the house the following day, but couldn't find any fingerprints other than Kiyoshi's and Ikuko's. Luminol testing revealed that quite a large amount of blood had been cleaned up from the bathroom and hallway. DNA testing revealed the blood in the bathroom to have been Ikuko's, while that in the hall came from both Ikuko and Kiyoshi. The amount of blood Ikuko lost was incompatible with life. By this point, it was clear that Ikuko was dead, and highly likely that Kiyoshi was as well. Yet there were no bodies, and their car was gone. So, where were they? The Kinefuchi's car was seen by the N System Surveillance Network on National Highway 357 at 2pm on May 19th, the day after they disappeared, going south towards Kisarazu City in Chiba Prefecture. It was then seen again at 4pm in Kinchi, Sumida City, Tokyo. From there, the car made its way towards the Kanetsu Expressway, heading towards Nagano. At 7pm, the car was seen getting off the Nagano-Saku interchange, and then went silent for the night. It was then captured on the end system again the following morning at 8am on the Nagano Expressway, Shiojiri Interchange. Then at 10am, it was seen on the Chuo Expressway, Aichi Komaki Higashi Interchange. This was the last sighting of the car until some four months later. On September 26th, the Kinefuchi's car was discovered in Meito Ward, Nagoya. It's important to keep in mind that the man seen impersonating Kiyoshi at the bank was wearing a Chunichi Dragons baseball cap, the team for Nagoya, making it highly likely that he was a local. The car had been left parked in a no parking area. The police attempted to lift fingerprints from inside the car, but it had been wiped clean. However, they did discover urine on the back seat, and the blood of both Kiyoshi and Ikuko in the trunk. A picture was being painted, but there were still large portions of it missing. Piecing together what the police had learnt, the most likely scenario was that the man, or men, posing as police officers were, in fact, intending to scam the Kinefuchis of their money. 
Whether the scammers intended to kill them from the beginning was unknown, but that Friday night, when Kiyoshi returned home from work, Ikuko was killed and Kiyoshi attacked as well. It was unknown whether Kiyoshi died in the house or later in the car, but both bodies were put into the boot, their house cleaned of blood, and then the murderer, or murderers, drove their car from Chiba to Nagoya over the weekend. Presumably, the bodies were dumped somewhere along the way, and then their car abandoned at the destination. It wouldn't be discovered until four months later. Yet, further investigations revealed even more puzzling questions. On May 16th at 7.37am, the day after the first police officer showed up and two days before her disappearance, Ikako sent an email to one of her colleagues. Subject. How are you? I'm not good. Contents. There's been an incident. It's up there as one of the three biggest, most troubling incidents of my life. So much so that I'm debating whether I should go into work today. I was depressed the whole day yesterday. I wonder if I'll be able to work after this. I'm relying on... Name blurred. Thank you. From Ikuko. Unfortunately, Ikuko's colleague didn't notice this email until nearly a week later, on May 22nd, several days after her disappearance. By the time Ikuko sent this email on Wednesday morning, all she had done was speak to the fake police officer with her husband. That officer had informed them of a prowler on the loose that was targeting their house. That was all. How could this simple conversation have ranked as one of the three worst incidents of Ikuko's life? The puzzle pieces didn't fit. Unless, of course, Ikuko wasn't telling the truth. The information about the police officers visiting Ikuko's house on May 15th and 16th came from Yamada, her boss at work. She was the one who informed him of the conversation that took place. The only people aware of what really took place, however, were Ikuko and her husband. And as the police continued their investigations, things took yet another unexpected turn. Police received Ikuko's broken PC from her eldest son, and they were able to restore hundreds of sent emails. Over 100 of them were related to a pyramid scheme selling makeup. Rumours had spread around the workplace that Ikuko had borrowed a rather large sum of money related to the scheme, potentially up to 1 million yen. When she was unable to pay that back, the person who lent her the money supposedly sent Yakuza around to get it. It wasn't uncommon for Yakuza to pose as police officers to extort money from people at the time. Suddenly, a different picture was being painted. The rumours were, of course, rumours. No one could confirm or deny whether Ikuko was in any debt, nor whether the fake police officers were actually Yakuza members. Yet, it seemed more likely, especially with the discovery of Ikuko's involvement in the pyramid scheme, that she was in some type of financial trouble. The fake police officers were perhaps not there to warn her about a thief that was, for some unknown reason, specifically targeting her house, but were actually debt collectors. Rough-looking gang members suddenly showing up on the doorstep of an elderly couple would quickly raise alarms in their small neighbourhood, but people wouldn't think twice about police officers. Ikuko being in debt large enough to send collectors to her home would certainly rank as one of the three most troubling incidents of her life, as opposed to an unknown thief targeting her house. The Yakuza have a large presence in Nagoya, with the Kodokai, one of the largest syndicates in Japan, based there. The man captured on bank security cameras withdrawing Kiyoshi's money wore a cap of the local Nagoyan baseball team. After the couple disappeared, their car was discovered abandoned in Nagoya. Was this unassuming elderly couple truly killed by the Yakuza because of an unsettled debt? The truth is, we may never know. Nearly 20 years have passed since the couple disappeared, and 
The main suspect, if still alive, would be in his 80s by now. There are still numerous missing pieces to the puzzle and details that don't make sense upon closer examination. Was it truly a Yakuza hit, or perhaps something else entirely? What do you guys think about this one? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you again next time.